the perfect blend of ethereal elegance and historic flair, the chemise à la reine, aka the original cottagecore gown, has been a favorite among historical costumers. Personally, I want to make one of these beautiful gowns, I just have to find the perfect fabric and like 100 hours of free time, which is much easier said than done. However, it might be shocking to learn that only a few Chemise Saint Laurent still exist in the world today, even when other contemporary dress styles have many, many more examples. I have a few hypotheses why this is, and I'm going to present those to you today. I haven't necessarily researched these theories to see if they're true or false, but I have sort of an overarching idea of the history of dress and just want to present these for you to chew on. If you don't know me, I'm Margaret, I am a historical costumer and textile conservator in training, and I have been working in the field of historic dress for about four years now, meaning I have a broad knowledge in dress history and also in history in general, but I haven't necessarily done the archival research to prove or disprove these theories. Before we dive into those though, I think it's important that we all have sort of a groundwork for what the chemise à la reine is and what it represents. The chemise à la reine was popular in the UK and Europe in the 1780s and got its namesake from its popularity within the inner circle of Marie Antoinette. In 1783, a portrait of Marie Antoinette wearing the gown was exhibited at the salon. It was painted by her friend and fellow chemise lover Vijay Lebrun. The portrait was derided for showing the queen in her quote-unquote underwear as the dress resembled a chemise, the standard undergarment of the day. Thus, the dress was titled Chemise à la Reine, or Underwear of the Queen. Vijay Lebrun painted a second portrait to replace it at the salon, showing the queen in a more formal silk gown. If you want to know more about this specific portrait, I do recommend, I think it's the first episode of A Stitch in Time, where Amber Bernhardt takes us through this painting and its significance, and also there is a masterful recreation of the gown done. It's really stunning and really awesome. I believe you can find it on Acorn TV, who is not a sponsor of this video, but hopefully one day they may be. I love Acorn TV. <laughs> Marie and her friends, including Vijay Lebrun, would often wear dresses like these, more informal gowns, when they were frolicking at the hamlet at the Petit Trianon, outside of Versailles. I've actually been to this hamlet and it is stunning. It's one of those things that just, it shouldn't exist. It's so odd and weird and beautiful and just, completely mind-boggling at the same time. The gown itself became intrinsically linked with pastoralism of the period and this sort of escapist romanticism of peasant life, which Marie was doing at the Hamlet, specifically. On the other side of the channel, Chemise à la Reine populate Reynolds and Gainsborough portraits and reach into Europe as well. This is an iconic piece of the period, signaling the winds of change towards a neoclassical aesthetic in the dawn of the next century. These dresses were made of superfine imported in Indian muslin in white, and sometimes were embroidered. The bodice would be gathered by drawstring at the neckline, the underbust, and the waist, and also throughout the sleeves to create those beautiful puffs and poofs. The beautiful full skirt would be completely gathered all the way around into the waistline and be about floor length. They would have been worn over your traditional 18th century underwear that included a shift, um, some stays, normally a more lightweight style of stays, not that super rigidly bone stays you would see in court dress, um, a bum pad, and also a petticoat. These dresses were often accessorized with bows, sashes, and very large hats. They're relatively simple in aesthetic and decoration, unlike some Italian gowns or court dress of the period, and also held this sort of air of pastoralism and anglomania within Europe that was frankly trendy at the time. It's important to contextualize this dress within the larger span of history too, and that means within the colonialist economy that was happening at the time. Imported Indian muslin and cotton in general were becoming very, very fashionable within Europe, this drove both the English expansion into India as well as the transatlantic slave trade. If you would like to learn more about this specific topic, I recommend the book Empire of Cotton by Sven Beckett, and I will also link some relevant content in the description box. Additionally, it's important to note that the origins of this style are not fully known. Historians have theorized that this is an adaptation of lightweight gowns worn by women in the tropics, potentially in India or the Caribbean. I will also link some articles about that down below. There isn't really a solid answer for that question and more research is really needed on that topic. So now that we're all on the same page about what the chemise à la reine is, 
let's talk about the chemise Lorraine that are still in existence. As far as I know, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I could only find two chemise Saint Laurent cataloged on the internet in museum collections. There might be more in existence that just aren't on the internet. Digitizing collections takes forever, I'm aware of that. But the only two I could find are from the Manchester City Gallery of Art and also the Musée de la Toile de Jouy in France. The one at the Musée des Toiles de Jouy is actually in the Stitch in Time episode, so you can see that in action in that episode as well. Jamie's gowns are so delicate, there are only two known to be in existence. One is held at a small museum near the Palace of Versailles. It has come to my attention while doing the research for this video that there is a muslin dress at the Met from this period. I don't know if you would classify it as a chemise à la reine, it doesn't really have the fluffiness to it that a chemise normally does, but there is one there. This makes the chemise à la reine ultra rare when it comes to museum collections. Even the robe volant, which is also considered ultra rare, has a few more examples than that of the chemise à la reine. I'll link an interesting article below about the robe volant that the Musée Galerie actually purchased a couple of years ago, which kind of tells you like how ultra rare these things are. And if you compare that to the chemise à la reine, the chemise à la reine is even more rare. It's just shocking to me that such a popular style in the 1780s would have so few examples left, especially when our museum collections are populated with 1780s styles. So I've had this knocking around in my brain for a couple of weeks now, and I want to share some theories that I think are compelling with you. If you have any theories of your own, please pop those down below in the comments. Also, if you have any opinions on whether or not you think my theories have legs, also pop those down below in the comments. I would love to have a conversation about this and sort of start an exploration into it. So let's start off with the theories. The first is that the chemise à la reine is just not that popular. I think there's this overarching idea within the costuming community that the chemise à la reine was like this iconic, everyone was wearing it moment within the 1780s. And I think we have to challenge that notion because I don't necessarily think it reflects historical fact. Chemise à la reine aren't the most practical of garments. It's a white, sheer, very easily damaged garment that is also made of a very expensive prestige textile that super fine muslin from India would have been quite cost prohibitive. This means that this style would have been basically only for the upper class, probably not even the middle class, maybe. And although it populates portraiture, that doesn't necessarily mean it was for everyday wear. However, when you do have something made out of a prestige textile that's like super high end and fancy, normally that gets saved over your mundane objects. So there is a good chance that the chemise à la reine would have stuck around, but since there may not have been as many made, then there's just less chances of that certain style making it to today. Now, this garment was also pretty high fashion at the time, meaning that within the upper class, there was a subset of super fashionable people that would probably be wearing it. This means that it narrows the field even more for the types of people who would be wearing this specific style. I kind of think of this style along the lines of that of like the Marvelous and the aesthetics, possibly not as narrow as the Marvelous or the Incroyable in the early 19th century when it comes to dress. Still, it's probably not the wide reaching style we tend to think of it as. But this is probably not its only reason for its scarcity and we will get into that. These things kind of build off of one another. The second theory is about use and reuse of textiles. I personally love this topic, but essentially in the 18th century, you would definitely reuse your textiles, especially if they were prestige textiles. I cannot tell you the amount of dresses I've seen that are a 1740s fabric made into like a 1770s dress. I'm actually working on one of those right now at my internship. Basically what would happen is these gowns would be resized for a new body, resized for a new style, or potentially cut up and made into household textiles, including upholstery or hangings of some sort. Because of this cultural reuse, it's very possible that a 1780s chemise à la reine may have become a 1790s or early 19th century empire style. That's really not out of the question and would honestly make sense within the context of the period. Additionally, they could have been made into petticoats, curtains, children's wear, etc., etc. However, there's still a lot of dresses in collections that weren't reused to the point where they are no longer dresses. And that's where my third, more out of the box theory comes in. So hear me out on this one. So my third theory is about the 18th century paper making industry. So when you've got a prestige textile, like a, like a brocade or a wool or something else, it's end of life 
sort of options are kind of limited. You have it being made into upholstery, and then maybe after that it gets scrapped and made into stuffing, or maybe it just gets thrown out at that point. The same can be kind of said for colored linens and cottons, although those could be household rags, etc., etc. When it comes to white linens and cottons in the 18th century, there's actually a specific end of life plan for these, and that is the paper making industry. Now, in the 18th century, paper was completely handmade and it was made from linen fibers, and then by the end of the century they are adding cotton fibers in. By the 19th century it's almost all cotton, and then we get wood pulp papers in the late 19th century. So essentially, when you have these beautiful linens and cottons, they can be sold at a higher price on the rag market to these paper producers, essentially. Now, 18th century paper came in different kinds of grades. So you had your brown paper for wrapping things up. That could be made from everything from ship ropes to, you know, raggedy rags. Essentially, it was linen, cotton, hemp fibers even that were just kind of thrown in there and made into this sort of disposable paper. Then you had blue paper, then you had your white papers, you had a coarse white, you had your regular white, and then you had your fine white. The whiter the paper, the finer the fibers, the higher price you would get paid for both your rags and your paper at the end. Thus, the chemise à la would have been prime paper fodder. These are super bright, white, beautiful fibers that would have been great for the paper making industry. So it's very possible that these gowns, when they were worn out, when they weren't fashionable anymore, would have been sold on to a secondhand market where they're not super useful for a lot of things, and they may have been sold on to the paper making industry. Although it might seem weird for these prestige imported textiles to be sent up to a paper mill upstate, it is something that probably happened to at least a few of these dresses and could account for the reason why they were reused at a rate where they are no longer in existence. My really only pause with this theory is that we have so many muslin, cotton, beautiful white dresses um, in later periods, like directly after in the 1790s and also in the Regency period as well. I think this might be because they were just more popular. I mean, the neoclassical aesthetic was everywhere. Almost all classes of society at this point could afford that sort of white muslin cotton fabric because frankly, the industry had been completely taken over by the British at that point and they were starting to produce cotton muslin um, in the UK and on the continent and not just overseas. For that reason, more of these dresses probably survived because of that, but still it gives me pause. Of course, although it's an interesting thought, this would obviously need a lot more research, like basically all of the theories in this video. So in conclusion, the chemise à la reine is this popular, iconic piece of the 1780s, which just doesn't seem to exist in the modern material record anymore. Many factors probably contributed to this, including the theories that we spoke about and many others that I have not even touched on. Personally, I find this style to be beautiful aesthetically as well as complex in the myriad of stories it can tell. Not only can it tell stories about this pastoral escapism, this aesthetic movement in the 18th century with this gorgeous beauty, but it also tells stories of exploitation and the growing global colonialization that was happening in the 18th century. It has so many interesting avenues to go down exploring the twilight years of the ancient regime and really putting our global consumption under the microscope. My only hope is that we find a few more of these knocking around in an attic somewhere so that we can tell this story through the material culture of our world. And with that all being said, I hope you enjoyed this video. Again, my name is Margaret. This is Costume and Conservation. If you want to hit the subscribe button down below or the like button for this video, that would be lovely. You can follow me on Instagram at Costume and Conservation and also over on TikTok at Costume and Conservation. I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye!